A London psychologist once told Billy Graham that 70% of people in mental hospitals in England could be released if they could find forgiveness. Their problem was a bad conscience, and they could gain no relief from the guilt and pressure under which they lived. I read once of a man, writes Ray Stedman, who wrote a letter to the Bureau of International or Internal Revenue saying, I haven't been able to sleep because last year when I filed out my income tax report, I deliberately misrepresented my income. I am enclosing a check for $150, and if I still can't sleep, I'll send you the rest. That is one way of handling a bad conscience, but I can predict that it will not work. The only way that works is the way set forth in Psalm 51. This is one of the few psalms where we are given the historical background from which it arose. The inscription reads, A Psalm of David, when Nathan the prophet came to him after he had gone into Bathsheba. The psalm pertained to David's double sin of adultery and murder while he was king. He had walked with God for many years, had gained a reputation as a prophet, and had established himself as the longtime spiritual leader of his people. Then suddenly, toward the end of his reign, he plunged into the terrible double sin. The interesting thing is that David himself records this sin for us. It must have been painfully humiliating. You remember the account. He was on his palace roof one day when the army had gone out to the battle, and he saw a beautiful woman bathing herself while his passion was aroused. He sent over messengers and ordered her to be brought to him. He entered into an adulterous relationship with her. Her husband Uriah, a soldier in David's army, was away fighting for his king. Later, David learned that Bathsheba was expecting a child. In a final desperate attempt to cover up his evil, he ordered Uriah, the husband, to be put in the forefront of the battle where he would most certainly be killed. When news of Uriah's death reached the king, he thought he had safely covered up his sin. In Psalm 32, David records how he felt during that terrible time when he was trying to cover up his sin. When I kept silent, he said, my bones grew old enough, old through my groaning all the day long. Psalm 32, 3. For a year, he tried to live with a bad conscience, but as the story records, God sent a prophet to David. God loved this king too much to let him go on covering up his sin and thus damaging himself and his entire kingdom. So God sent the prophet Nathan to David. In a most dramatic moment, David knew that his sin was uncovered. He fell on his face before God, and out of that experience of confession comes this beautiful 51st Psalm, which traces for us the proper way to handle a bad conscience. It opens with a prayer for forgiveness. Have mercy on me, O God, according to thy steadfast love, according to thy abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. Psalm 51, 1-2. What a marvelous understanding of the nature of sin and the character of God's forgiveness is found in these verses. There are three things David asks for. First, he understands that sin is like a crime. If criminals are to be delivered from the effects of their crime, they do not need justice but mercy. Sin is an illegal act, a violation of justice, and an act of lawlessness and rebellion, and therefore requires mercy. Then he says, blot out my transgressions, and thereby he reveals that he understands sin is like a debt. It is something owed, an account that has accumulated and needs to be erased. Finally, he cries, Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. He understands that sin is like an ugly stain, a defilement upon the soul. Even though the act fades into the past, the dirty, defiling stain remains a stigma upon the heart. So he cries out and asks to be delivered from these things. Notice that David understands well the basis for forgiveness. He asks on the basis of two things. First, according to God's unfailing love. He understands that he himself deserves nothing from God, that God is not bound to forgive him. Some people are never able to realize forgiveness because they think they deserve it, that God owes it to them. But David knows better. He realizes that only because of God's love may he even approach God to ask. On the basis of that unqualified acceptance, that marvelous continuing love that will not let him go, he says to God, I am coming to you and asking now for this. Second, as David appeals to God according to his great compassion, he again indicates his understanding of the character of God. God is not a penny pincher. He does not dole out bits of mercy drop by drop. No, he pours it out. His are abundant mercies. When God forgives, he forgives beyond our utmost imaginings. Two figures of speech that are used in the Old Testament depict the forgiveness of God. As far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed our transgressions from us. Psalm 103, 12. How far is... That? Well, how far do you have to go east before you start going west? You never come to west. Then God says that he will hurl all our iniquities into the depths of the sea. Micah 7.19 Someone has added that he puts up a sign that reads, No fishing. Do not go down there and try to fish old sins out once God has dealt with them. 
when relief comes when we begin to understand the, this fullness of God's forgiveness. The Word of God teaches the true nature of sin and the astounding basis for God's forgiveness. As we learn, and are we learning actually to live in these liberating truths? Because it's not just simply going to God and saying, forgive me, but going to God and confessing you are a sinner and that you need forgiveness. You have done wrong for the Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans 3.23. So even if you don't remember it, God does because he's perfect and he's holy and he never forgets anything. And then it says in Romans 6.23 that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. We don't have to be separated from God, death. We can be saved. In Romans 10.9, we read that if we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in our heart that God has raised him from the dead, we will be saved instantly and that he will never leave us nor forsake us. Hebrews 13.5 tells us this. See, Jesus is equal with the Father. He is the Son of God. He came to earth to die on the cross and he rose again, conquering all death and sin. See the chapter of 1 Corinthians 15. And it's because of this triumphant victory that he can take away our sins because he paid for them. And he can save our souls because he bought them. And he can forever treat us with full grace and mercy and love as if we never sinned, imputing his righteous robe over us forever. And that's the wonderful gospel. And, and that's the wonderful thing about Christ and Jesus and God. There is no other way. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. That is Jesus in John fourteen six. I hope you make that decision today. Simply bow your head, pray to God, confess these things, and tell him you believe. Ask him to be your savior.